In the early hours of June the 28th, 1969, the first rock was thrown outside the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, New York City. After years of police raids, intimidation, aggression and arrests, the drag queens, street boys, gay men and women had had enough and they fought back, with protests continuing for several nights. It would lead to the founding of the gay liberation movement. Around the same time as the Stonewall riots were happening, 10-year-old Keith Herring was living with his conservative parents in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. He was passionate about art at a very young age, and his father, an amateur cartoonist, encouraged his son's ambition to one day work for the Walt Disney Corporation. Keith Haring was from a generation of kids born during the Cold War, who saw the news as it happened, on TV. He was exposed to a whole new level of sophisticated advertising, pitching products, ideas, desires, aspirations and concepts at breakneck speed as he sat on the couch. This is where he developed his skills in simplifying complex ideas using memorable graphics. He instinctively knew that a combination of slogans and visuals could be a powerful force and later, he would sell difficult politics in the same way Madison Avenue sold vacuum cleaners. In 1978, Keith Haring left his perfectly safe suburban life in Pennsylvania because, as he later said, he needed intensity for his art, but also intensity in his life. And there was only one place to go, New York City. As long as anyone can remember, people have been expressing themselves by writing or drawing on public walls. There's a word for this. It's called graffiti. The city exposed Herring to graffiti, targeted by the authorities and overlooked by the art world, but valued by Herring and others for its technical mastery and direct connection to the public. At college, he was already experimenting with text and performance, but was attracted to graffiti, which often uses bold expressive lines and simplified forms to create impactful visuals. And Herring adopted these characteristics in his own work. He developed a distinct style of fluid continuous lines and invented his own visual language. And the democratic nature of graffiti meant he could create art that would reach and engage a broad public. It would be a career long theme for Herring, breaking down barriers between high art and low art bringing in an urban community, and particularly working class communities. He wanted his work accessible to everyone, and not just the elite. He called the New York subway his laboratory, experimenting with ideas and form, taking on the rectangles of black paper used to cover expired advertisements. Herring, using chalk, did hundreds of drawings over a five year period, and was arrested several times. The simplicity of the images was a necessity, as he had to work quickly to avoid getting caught. But sometimes, the hastily drawn panels managed to perfectly capture the frenetic energy of New York City. The radiant baby became his trademark. The beauty of Herring's work is its positive, life-affirming quality, and his subway works struck a nerve with blasé commuters facing the daily grind. They looked forward to seeing what he drew next and where, and before long, mainstream media noticed him too. And almost overnight, he became a star. How did you manage that? At the same time that I was doing things in the subways, I had began showing things in galleries and um, things in the press and things. Herring had kept his sexuality strictly under wraps from his conservative parents. But in New York, he got to finally experience his authentic gay identity in an environment that had been fostered by the Stonewall riots. It was a cliche, but it was true. You could be whatever you wanted in New York City. And Keith Haring quickly found his tribe. For a period, the New York club scene became the New York art scene. And at the iconic Club 57, located in a church basement in the East Village, Herring would put on art shows and become friends or friendly rivals with fellow painters Jean-Michel Basquiat and Kenny Scharf. 
joining artists creating work outside of the elitist and restrictive world of the galleries and museums. They weren't producing the austere conceptual art being shown uptown, but art that was noisy, dirty, chaotic, liberating, colourful and fun. Nightclubs were an important part of what shaped Herring's art. The music, the energy and above all, the dancing are all reflected in the fluidity and rhythm of his figures and his line. A mystery disease known as the gay plague has become an epidemic unprecedented in the history of American medicine. The first time the public heard about AIDS was in 1981 when an article described 41 cases of a rare cancer in young, otherwise healthy gay men in Los Angeles. It was the very beginning of the AIDS crisis and the word soon became synonymous with death. Herring's development as an artist and as a person came at a conservative time in Western politics. Margaret Thatcher was elected as UK leader in 1979. Ronald Reagan became the president of the US in 1981 and Helmut Kohl became chancellor of Germany in 1982. It wasn't until September 1985, four years after the first cases, that Reagan even said the word AIDS. By that point, it was a full-blown epidemic. During the summer, I start to notice trouble with my breathing. I was inspecting every day and waiting to see the purple splotch, and I found a spot on my leg. Herring was diagnosed with AIDS in 1987. Just over two years later, at the height of his fame, he was dead. Herring knew his time was limited, and in those last two years, he travelled all over the world, creating work and organising shows. His list of to-do projects just got bigger. Political activism had driven Herring's bright, brief career, and he truly believed in the power of art to change the world. This belief, combined with the immediacy of his cartoon style, came together spectacularly in the 1980s. He had made posters against apartheid in South Africa and for nuclear disarmament groups, created works with inner-city kids, produced anti-drugs billboards and posters that attacked those condemning sexual freedom. And then he went for the American government and its shockingly inadequate response to the AIDS crisis with a series of posters. And he also took time to create the Keith Haring Foundation to raise money for AIDS organizations and children's programs. To date, it has raised $20 million for charities. It was during this maelstrom of activity and one year into his diagnosis that he produced his most iconic poster. The modern poster as we know it dates back to the mid-19th century when the printing industry perfected colour lithography and made mass production of large and inexpensive images possible. Many fine artists worked in the medium. Jules Chéret was a French painter and lithographer who became a master of Belle Epoque poster art. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec's posters for the Moulin Rouge established him as one of the foremost poster artists of the late 19th century. Alphonse Mucha was a Czech Art Nouveau artist, one of the most prominent poster designers. And the 20th century saw great artists like Ernst Keller and Victor Vasily producing limited edition posters. Herring had championed the poster format as a traditional form of political activism. He saw in them the immediacy which we now think of when we think of his aesthetic. It was in 1982 that he created one of his first posters. He printed and paid for 30,000 of them, which he gave out for free during an anti-nuclear protest in New York. He would use his platform to get us talking about socio-political issues, often ignored, by employing a tradition used by political agitators since printing began. There is a generosity to Herring often lacking in the art world. He was a populist who wanted his work out there for the world to see, for free. The art establishment didn't really understand it, but Herring really believed that art was for everybody. The artist saw the potential in posters as a democratizing force, affordable, mass-produced and collectible. Public accessibility was a consistent concern in Herring's work, and posters were a way to reach the widest audience possible. All that, I mean, it was definitely art for, um, art for the age of mechanical reproduction. 
The artist had used the wise monkey figures before in an earlier work that was inspired by the political organization ACT UP, who in 1987 had coined the slogans Silence equals death and ignorance equals fear. The painting also has the pink triangle the Nazis used to identify gay people in concentration camps, which had been appropriated by ACT UP and reclaimed as a badge of pride. The poster uses a more pared-down graphic than the original painting, and that was typical of Herring's punchy street posters, which were designed to catch the eye of casual passers-by. This work was plastered all over New York City and became the most famous and impactful of all the AIDS activists' work. At the time he created this poster, the numbers of reported AIDS cases in the United States had reached 100,000, and many couldn't afford the available medication. The mainstream was unwilling to discuss it openly, but Keith Haring forced us to talk about AIDS. If you don't have money in the city, you can't, you know, it's an expensive disease. People that can't, you can't get enough money to get your AIDS here to get whatever you have. You don't, you know, people just give up. In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, he told the world he was HIV positive. This was so brave, at a time that it was considered career suicide. My work and all art really is, a, is about life. Um, especially, um, I mean, my life is my work and my work is my life. And so the two things are completely intertwined and are almost one and the same. This is a man who had no shame in an era of shame, who wouldn't be silenced when no one else was speaking up. And he spoke loudly and often against the stigma and prejudice associated with the disease. People still believed you could catch AIDS from a kiss or even from a toilet seat, and religious leaders were loud in their condemnation of any form of education as propaganda. Mainstream society saw the disease as one that only affected gay men, Haitians, sex workers and drug addicts. But with ignorance equals fear, Herring portrays three individuals whose race and gender are not obvious, and by using his trademark de-individualized unisex figures, he sends a coded message that everyone is a target. All three figures have a pink X on their chests, symbolizing age patients, and are covering their ears, mouth and eyes, like the three wise monkeys who see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. As with many of his primitive figures, the three in the poster appear to be jumping or dancing, a reflection of the hip-hop music he was obsessed with and the club scene he hung out at. If you ignore the text, the work could be read as a fun clubbing scene. It captures that energy, and that's the point. It draws you in with its simple lines and primary colors, and then it hits you with its message, loud and clear. Somebody had to shout about AIDS, and it might as well be Keith Haring. He never sketched beforehand or planned anything, but let it flow spontaneously like automated writing. His line was described as continuous, not because it is uninterrupted, but because it has a fluidity that runs through all his works, through dancing figures, barking dogs and crawling babies, and through time and space. These graphic lines and colors tap into a body of work that started on the New York subway over 10 years before. In the simple, visually fun image, Herring encapsulates how a generation of gay men were ignored, too afraid to stand up and say something because of fear, because of shame. This work, so simplistic on the surface, changed how people thought about AIDS, and that is both subversive and deeply profound. In February 1990, Herring was seriously ill with late-stage AIDS-related infections, including lymphoma. He was receiving 24-hour care when his studio manager came in with a letter from the Walt Disney Corporation. They wanted him to work on a Mickey Mouse project. He had dreamed of this since he was a child. But he didn't believe the letter was real and thought his friend was lying to make him feel good. When he finally realized it was a genuine offer, it was too late. Herring's death on February the 16th, 1990, meant he lost his chance to give Mickey Mouse new life. He was only 32 years old. You know, I never had any sort of delusions about living until I was going to be an old person. But there's works that I've created that are going to stay here forever. There's thousands of real people, not just museums and curators that have been 
affected and inspired and, and taught by the work that I've done. So the work is going to live on long past when I'm going to be here.